have a, I just have a quick announcement. Um, there was an email that went out about the usher and greeter meeting. Um, I'm having a meeting next week, July 25th at 10.15. If anybody is interested in greeting or ushering, we're going to discuss that, what that looks like. Unfortunately, in the email, it said June. So we all already get that it's not June. So it'll be next, next Sunday. Thank you. Uh, you may be seated. Uh, why don't you come on up, Sheila? Just a brief announcement. She asked for 30 seconds. I need, I need 15. <laughs> Some of us aren't winded. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everybody. <laughs> um, I'm just up here to remind you, VBS is coming. Mark your calendars for August 15th through the 19th. Your leadership is what's needed to make this happen. I'm looking for volunteers for group leaders, game, craft, music lesson leaders also. You can come see me or sign up is on our website. Thank you guys. Do you have a video for that? Is there slides for that that we can play? The slides are incorrect. Okay. Well, did you see the slides? Okay. Um, I was hoping that Sheila would make the announcement, you'd see a short brief slide or video, and then I was going to tell you, this is this afternoon, right? And it's, uh, well, not the VBS, but our things this afternoon, and VBS is coming, and guess what? You've been told three times now. It takes three times for people to understand uh, that, uh, hey, there might be something that I should get involved in, something I should be aware of. So you'll want to be aware of VBS. Also, we have the second of our missions uh, outreach our, into, the, into communities today from 12 to 3. Where is it at? Rosecrans, right? Okay. The shelter house there. And again, uh, drop by. The community, we're targeting the community there to let them know Sunbury UMC is, is active and wants to be active in communities around us. And, uh, and want to care for their kids, want to care, you know. So these are just steps for us to, to make those relationships. And so uh, I want to stop right now, and I want to have a prayer for our mission community outreach. Um, so, Glenn, would you be willing to lead us in prayer, asking God to, to uh, be with us as we develop relationships with that community over there? Amen. Chloe, you want to come and share with us about, uh, about uh, the youth mission? Again, reaching out into a community that's in need within our location, Ohio, East Ohio Annual Conference. So Chloe, why don't you guide us? Okay. Good morning. Uh, two weeks ago, we left for the uh, 2021 Youth Work Mission trip. We went back to Steubenville for the second year in a row. Um, some of the jobs we did, uh, tear down and rebuilding of a deck, um, putting up a fence, um, and working at the new thrift, um, urban thrift that we worked on last year, uh, taking up tile and carpet. Um, and this year it's more finished and uh, they're, I think they're already open. Um, they had their grand opening when we were down there or right after we left. Um, work mission trips have always been super important, I think, to all the youth um, because we get to go out and help people that we've never met before, but we get you, or we get to um, usually put a smile on their face and just help somebody out. So um, I believe Glenn made the video for this um, of what we did down there. So I hope you enjoy it. All right. Thank you, Chloe. Lord, I find you in the seeking, Lord, I find you in the doubt, and to know you is to love you, and to know so 
little else I need you. Service is not youth only. It is not pastor and staff only. It is all the people of God. If you don't have any non-Christian friends that you can reflect Christ, then you need to broaden your circle of friendships. Seriously. I've been known to do that. The church needs to do that and Likewise, every disciple needs to be a part of that. My friends, our vision is very simple, and our mission is very simple, to make and to mature disciples. You find a Christian outside of your circle that needs encouragement to grow. You find a Christian out, or a non-Christian outside that needs to know about the love of Christ. And our vision for this church is to meet the needs in our community by introducing Jesus Christ. 
Introducing Jesus Christ. We come here to, to revive ourselves to go out. We don't come here to stay here and feel good. That's the whole, that's the whole story. So my friends, dollars are important. Dollars are important. But dollars alone will never do it. It needs to be you and me. By the way, just for the record, uh, about... Um, uh, a little over a year and a half ago, you'll never guess where I was at. McDonald's. Thank you. You've forgotten in a week only? <laughs> McDonald's. And you'll never guess what happened. I was having a rough day, and I, I was, was stopping in there to, to, to kind of take a break and regroup, and some man came over and said, oh, you know what? You look like you're carrying a heavy load today. We got a group of guys over here that are uh, praying and studying the Bible. Would you like to come? Right in McDonald's. They're defiling the temple, my friends. <laughs> no. <laughs> but that's what we're supposed to be. So, my friends, that video and the youth are showing us how. Now, you still didn't get a sermon yet, right? And so, let's join each other as we worship God together. Thank you, Karen. Wow. Yeah. Amen. Good stuff. Jesus. Jesus. There's just something about that name. Let me encourage you this morning, church, to just, where you are, just enter into God's presence this morning. As we sing that song, there's something about that name. Jesus, Jesus, oh Jesus, there's just something about that name. You're our master, our savior. Like the fragrance 
after the rain. Oh, Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim that kings and kingdoms, they'll all pass away. But there's just something about that name. Let's sing that one more time. Just enter in this morning, church. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Savior Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Oh, Jesus, 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 let all heaven.
Join me in the congregational prayer. This is responsive. God of wisdom. Open our hearts to your call. Give us understanding minds. That we may know your will. Give us discerning minds. That we may see your truth and walk in paths of righteousness. Teach us to use our time wisely. That we may make good use of your gifts. Give us joyful hearts that we may sing and rejoice in your love. Fill us with your spirit. That we may walk in wisdom all our days. Gracious God, you offer humanity a choice. We will choose to walk in your ways, the ways of wisdom and goodness, the ways of justice and righteousness, or we will live as unwise people, turning aside from your gracious mercy. Give us wise and discerning minds, that we may be faithful to you in all that we do. Lead our feet on your paths of Righteousness and justice. Teach us your peace. Amen. Please join us in singing the hymn, Lead Me to the Cross.
please join me in the invitation to the offering. God's ways lead to a rich and meaningful life. God's paths lead to righteousness and justice and abundant resources. Choose God's ways of wisdom and bring your gifts that God's work may flourish in our world. and loving God, you have given us a heritage of faith. You show us the ways of wisdom that lead to life and peace. We are rich in your blessings. With grateful hearts, we offer you our gifts that they may enable your work of justice and mercy. We offer you our very selves that we may walk in your ways of understanding and wisdom. Amen. Come here, Lord, today. And if we can bring your Bibles, okay, bring your Bibles. We're going through a sermon series that is walking through the book of Ruth. And if you weren't here last time, we unpacked just the first time I did uh, on the book of Ruth. And if uh, you weren't here, then you might not be familiar with the story. Let me just give a short re recap. You see, there's a man living in Bethlehem, he married to a woman named Naomi. They have two sons, and they have a family in Israel during this time. And so Elimelech has two choices to make. Does he stay and try to ride out the famine? Or does he move to Moab? A place that is ungodly. It's about 55 miles away. Now the Moabites, they worship the different god. In fact, it was a false god. And they were actual enemies of Israel. And if you go back and you look through the, the Deuteronomy passages uh, dealing with Moab, you find that they're under a curse from God. Because as God was leading his people out of Egypt through that area, they refused to help them, even provide a drink for uh, God's people coming out of Egypt. In fact, if you turn to Deuteronomy chapters 23, verse 6, you will hear these words, that you are not to see a treaty of friendship with them. So God's written them off. It's interesting to find that God sometimes says, you know what, I have this plan, and this is what I'm working on, and you're not following it. And God bypasses it, blesses it anyway, and says, you know, you have a chance. And you didn't do it. You hardened your heart, in essence. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us that a little like choice was unwise. It doesn't, the Bible doesn't make any, any reference to that. But what you have to do is look at the outcome. And then you can start deciphering whether it was a wise choice or a poor choice. So here's the outcome. That uh, he dies, Elimelech dies, and uh, his two sons marry Moabite women, which they're not supposed to have anything to do with. I mean, not the women, but I mean Moab. And then his two sons die. And here Naomi left in a strange land, practicing strange worship rituals, and she's left her, with her two Moabite daughter-in-law. Their names were Ruth. Anybody know who's the second one? Orpha. Not Oprah. Last week, I mentioned four major points. One, my friends, you are free to make whatever choice you want. God, that's how God set this up. You can choose to stay away from church. You can choose to, you can make choices. They are your choices. But secondly, we are not free to choose the consequences of our choices. I'm going to be very clear about that. We can make a choice, but we cannot choose what the benefits or the punishment is or the consequences of that choice. The third point was that as we follow that story, God gives us an opportunity to repent and be restored if we do make a poor choice. 
And then finally, my friends, it is so easy, and we all have done it. I have done it. One big choice takes care of a lot of little choices that you might have done. So last week, we, we learned about the, the problem of making the wrong choice, the poor choice. Today, we're going to follow the second half, as I told you last week, of that story. We're going to see that Ruth makes a wise choice to follow and to get back with God. Get back and it will sing with God. To follow the Lord and her choice, then we find out it affects her own life. But guess what? It affects, in a real sense, her daughter-in-law's life as well. Because you see, Ruth becomes the ancestors of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, at least from the human genealogy. So I invite you to open your Bibles. Anybody know where Ruth is at? It's in the Bible. That's great. I like that. It's right after Judges. You know, we find Judges in the first part of, of your Bible, the front part. And if you get to the, if you don't have a broad Bible with you, Bring one, I mean, uh, find a key Bible, follow along, and if uh, you happen to be so inspired in writing, please sit in a different spot next time so someone else can engage you with it. In verse 6, in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 6, we find that, that Naomi, when she heard in Moab, so she's still in her room, Sons and husbands have died, and she is still there. In some ways, she had a sense of responsibility to her daughter-in-laws. You see, in that, in that familial culture, that if once you married, you became a part of the other family. And the patriarch and the head of the family had to care for you. And so they really have, their laws and their rules say that she, they need to stay with Naomi. But when she heard in Moab that the Lord had come, finally had come to the aid of his people by providing them food, Naomi and her daughter-in-laws prepared to return home from there. So there's a couple of things in conjunction with what we learned last week. We see that some people in God's family choose to bounce back and forth. You ever seen that? Do we experience that today? Don't like this church? We bounce over there. Instead of saying and letting God work. We don't like that grocery store, we start going over here. Instead of saying, hey, can we uh, possibly get this or can this change? No, we just bounce. We bounce everywhere. Our faith seems to be based on bouncing as opposed to what God's Word says, and that is staying rooted in the Word of God. Staying rooted means planted firmly, not moving. In fact, if you go back into the Psalms, you'll see that we're supposed to be planted, and we'll be planted by a stream of living water. So Ruth, uh, in these days, it seems like uh, they choose where they think they get the most blessing out of things, as opposed to staying there and allowing the difficulties in life to help them grow in their faith. We also learned in that first few verses that the, we're free to choose, and you can make that choice, but not all choices are wise ones. And secondly, is that this verse mentioned that it was the Lord who brought an end to the famine. We talked last week about a famine is normally a judgment saying you've moved away. If your life is feeling like it's empty, maybe it's because you've moved away from God. You've made other choices. Maybe it's because that you're not rooted, because when you're not rooted, then you kind of bounce around and you really don't get fed. So we hear that God has brought an end to the famine in Israel. It wasn't luck, it wasn't global warming, it wasn't chance, it was God. So this scripture teaches us that, that God, whether it's visible or invisible, is in absolute control of everything that happens. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's, that it's God's will for us to... to continually live outside because God's going to take care of it anyway. It's just the opposite. 
What God is saying in this passage of Scripture is that even when bad things happen to us, God is still in control. God is still good. How many listen to the river? Uh, there's a song, not my notes. This is free. They say something like, uh, is he God? And you say, yes, he's God. Is he good? Yes, he's good. Is he a good God? Yes, he's a good God. So there's that, that correlation, no matter where you find yourself in life. And we can find illustration after illustration. In fact, I thought about this as I was working on this sermon, that the story of Joseph is a perfect example. Betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, spent 10 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. One bad thing after another happened to him, and yet, through it all, Joseph, by staying faithful to God, rises to second in command of Egypt. And, and when he happens to follow and show his faithfulness, he finally gets a chance to be reconciled with his brothers. Can someone find Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, and read that out loud for us, please? This will, this will, this will, will, uh, will emphasize what we just said. Genesis 50, just go ahead and read it out. 50, verse 20. Amen. God, you intended to harm me. You really had it out for me. But God intended it for good to accomplish what now is being done. The saving of many lives. God's invisible hand working in Joseph. And now we see that God, once again, God's invisible hand is working in Israel. And there, now there is food that is there. And when Naomi hears that the famine is over, she decides to go back and in verses 7 through 13 in the first chapter of Ruth, with her two daughter in laws she left. She made this decision. By law and culture, her daughter-in-laws had to go with her. They were a part of her family. They went where she went. But Ruth, understanding, remember last week we talked about when Elimelech made that choice to go to Egypt, uh, Egypt, to go to Moab, that he was picking up his wife and his family and moving them outside of the, the context and culture of their faith, moving them to a place where there was no church or synagogue, there was no fam, uh, family support, there was no spiritual support. They were in a hostile land. And Naomi, I believe, remembers that feeling and says to her daughter-in-laws, go back to your families. And may the Lord show kindness to you, the same kind of kindness that you have shown to me. And may the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And then she kissed them and she wept out loud, we're told. And said to her, this is what the two of them said, the daughter. We will go back to your people. But Naomi said, no, 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 no. Why would you come with me? And goes through this explanation. I have no sons. And even if I were to get married and were to get pregnant and had sons, it would be years before you'd be able to, to be married to them and to have sons and daughters. And I'm too old anyway, she says. And even if there were hope and so on and so forth. Would you be willing to wait that long? No. And this is the first time it's introduced. I'm bitter. It's more bitter for me, she says. And then she speaks these words. The Lord's hand has gone out against me. Have you ever felt that way? No, Naomi rightly confesses that God's invisible hand has, has been in control of these things, and, and she understands that, but then she assigns the, wrong, the blame to the wrong individual. She says, she says, it's God that did all this, that took my husband away and took my sons away. No, it was not. They were free to make a choice. Elimelech was free to make a choice, not free for the consequences. 
And she begins to remind herself of all the tragedies that she's experienced while she's there, being alone, trying to keep her faith alive with no one to talk to. And through those tragedies, she had slowly begun to grow bitter against God. Yeah, she may have been giving that lip service and still having, saying her prayers, still spending time, but inside there had been a change that took place that had her in the realm of depression, of feeling bitterness against God. It will kill, my friends. And even if you've not said it out loud, you may have said it internally and, and, and said, you know what, I am sick and tired of always trying to do what's right, and yet God's always against me. Oh, if God is really that good, maybe we've said, you know, why can't I find a good person to share my life with? Or God, listen, I have prayed even though not in my heart. I've surrendered my life, although not totally to you. And so why are you bringing this financial difficulty in my life? Or God, I've... I don't understand. You brought me an incredible Christian man, but why can't I have any children? If you're really that good, God, someone else might say, why did I get laid off? If you're a student, and I've experienced this, sadly to say, why did I get an F on that test? If you're really that good, I invite you to spend some time reading Psalm 1167. I won't take time to go into it, but there's a whole, whole thing, especially in that 67th verse, that reminds us. In fact, let me just read just one sentence. It's about sanctifying afflictions. It's a Puritan thought that they live through, sanctifying afflictions that it is through sometimes through those troubles in life that God really saves, moves us to that point of accepting the salvation of God. It's the idea that God may allow those afflictions to happen, but the purpose for those afflictions are to draw us closer, to draw us more in love with God. And yes, God could have kept Naomi's husband and sons from dying, that's true. But you see, God assigned the wrong blame. Naomi assigned the wrong blame, that is, to God. Those afflictions sometimes that we try to flee from are what really needs to draw us to God. When I was coaching high school soccer, first practice that they got, I said, folks, put the soccer balls away. You see that hill over there? The whole practice, we're going to run up the hill and down the hill. Up the hill, down the hill. Up the hill, down. They said, okay, they did it that day. They came back the next day. We're going to start playing soccer, right? We're going to kick a ball. I said, nope, today we're running up the hill, down the hill, up the hill, down the hill. We did that for two whole weeks. Up the hill, never touched the soccer ball, never talked about any strategies that, that we would employ. Two weeks. And at the end of every practice, after that two, uh, two weeks were done, we would spend a few minutes, then we'd spend more minutes on the game and more minutes on the strategy. But you know what? They didn't see the affliction that, was being, that they were experiencing was there for them to grow as soccer players. The first game they played, 15 minutes into the game, the other team was wore out. And they were just getting their hamstrings loosened. Life can be like that. Down in verse 16 of the chapter, we find that uh, 14 and 15, Orpah went back, and Ruth made a wise choice. I love this verse. In fact, it's my favorite verse in the entire book of Ruth. She says, please, Ruth, uh, Naomi, please, Naomi, please, 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 
Don't make me leave. That's the word urge. Don't make me leave. Don't make me turn away from you. And then she says these words. Where you will go, I will go. Where you will stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Ruth has become a woman of faith. A woman of faith. So let me tell you five things I want you to remember. For where you go, I will go. There's a new direction that she's choosing. Do you know this church is going in a new direction as well? We're going in a new direction. We're going with what God says. Not what we want. New direction. I mean, I ask the question, do we know what it means to be a Christian? Do, do we understand that there's one word that really is the key word for any disciple of Jesus Christ? It's called follow. A Christian, a disciple says to God, where you lead, I will go. It makes no difference. Catherine and I had to make those decisions as well and eventually led us to the United Methodist Church where I have no say in where I go to pastor. I have given that up and have become a follower of Jesus Christ. Where I am sent, I will go. Secondly, there's a new dependence that is there. She says, where you stay, I will stay. In other words, she's saying, I will look to you, God, to provide for me wherever we might go. Thirdly, there's a new desire. That desire gets transformed. Your people will be my people. Ruth is, is saying, I'm not going to align myself with the old ways. I am going with you, God, or with you, Naomi, because you know what? I've made these, these, this choice. It's really in our context, it's, it's the mark of a person being saved, that new desire to be with God's people and to do God's things. It's a contradiction. I'm sorry to say it this way, but it's a contradiction for a person to say they are saved, but then not want to gather together to, to once again reinvigorate themselves spiritually to go out into the world. Fourthly, there is a new devotion. For Ruth says, your God will be my God. And Ruth is saying, I don't want anything else in the world to, to clutter and to draw me away from God. I don't want the pagan gods anymore. I will, I've seen your God and I want to follow your God. And for that to happen, Ruth knew that she needed to surrender. And the last thing, there's a new dedication. Oh, we did this last week. We opened up the front and we said, this is a time for you to rededicate, a time if you don't know Jesus Christ, if it's not been the center of your life, if you've not been planted deep into the Word, then it's time to do that. And you don't have to come forward. You can... You can raise your hand, nobody will talk to you, but it's also a time to rededicate, to once again and renew that dedication. Listen to the depth of the dedication. In verses 17 and 18, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Not back to my family, not back to where I'm comfortable, not back to where I know everything. I have a new dedication to this. And then she says, may the Lord deal with me ever so severely. That, when you hear that kind of, when you hear that verbiage in, in the Hebrew, it's normally saying, may God curse me. May a curse from God come upon me. May the Lord deal with me ever so severely. If anything but death separates you and me. Have we said that with God? 
There is nothing that's going to stop me from being your hands and your feet in the community that I live in and with the people that I find in need. Is that the dedication that you've made? Or is that the dedication you'd be willing to make? Because listen to how Naomi takes this. Naomi then realized that Ruth was determined to go with her. Naomi became determined. She understood. Ruth is determined to charter this new path. It was only then that she stopped. My friends, I'm going to say it this way. As your pastor... I will not stop urging you to grow deeper in your faith. There's a Sunday school class that's going to recap and then going to explore even deeper than what we have. There's so much more here. In fact, I think there's two of them. Glenn's going to be doing one, and Harold is supposed to be doing one today. Pop in. Learn more about what it means to have that new direction. Learn what it means to make a wise choice and not a poor choice. And when you do that, God will be blessed and God will work, not always to make life easy, but to make sure that people will be drawn to the ever-bountiful love and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bring your Bibles next week, my friends. Amen. Please join us in singing, Yes, Lord. First Kings, second chapter, and John 6. May the God of steadfast love bless you. May Jesus, the living bread, feed you. May the spirit of wisdom guide you. Go forth with delight to walk in God's ways, rejoicing in God's faithfulness. 
Yes. Say yes. Yes. I'll say yes, Lord. 